um, the two uh, presentations we're about to hear now also deal with the operation of uh, the law in Ireland in practice. First of all, Janice Donlan um, from the Crisis Pregnancy Programme will outline the role of the Crisis Pregn Preg Pregnancy Programme uh, um, and in particular the role it plays in supporting women in crisis pregnancy and she will also give us a wider overview of crisis pregnancy in this jurisdiction. Um, and then we will have uh, Dr. Brendan O'Shea from the um, Irish College of General Practitioners, which has a regulatory function, as you know, in relation to general practitioners. And he's also a practicing general practitioner. And um, he will give us um, a pers the perspective of the GPs in Ireland and how they interact with the law as it stands. So we're still, we're still with the law as it is at the moment. Um, so we'll hear Janice first. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you to Justice Lavoy um, for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I know you would have received a, a briefing document from ourselves, and I know there's a lot of information within it, and there's a lot of information within the presentation also. So I thought I'd just give a brief overview of what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at the remit of our programme, which is the HSC Sexual Health and Crisis Pregnancy Programme. We're going to look to see where crisis pregnancy sits in legislation who experiences a crisis pregnancy, the decisions made following a crisis pregnancy, some key research statistics and trends, and also look at the role of funded services. So our program sits within the HSC and it um, has responsibility for addressing crisis pregnancy. And we really do that through two strategies. We have a strategy on um, sexual health strategy and we also have a crisis pregnancy strategy. And the work of the program is broken into four functions, and two of those functions will be addressed today. There is a funding of services, so that's funding of crisis pregnancy services, and there's a research and policy function as well. And really, the, the research um, function within the program underpins the work of the program, and much of the research that we present today is research that has been commissioned by the program. So we can see here that crisis pregnancy is defined in Irish legislation. It's defined in the legislation that set up the Crisis Pregnancy Agency. And it's defined as a pregnancy which is neither planned nor desired by the woman concerned and for which represents a personal crisis for her. We also recognise that this definition includes the experiences of women for whom a planned or desired pregnancy develops into a crisis over time due to a change in circumstances. If we look at research, we can see that crisis pregnancy is common. It's a common phenomenon. Approximately one third of women who have been pregnant in Ireland have experienced a crisis pregnancy. We see that women and their partners who have a crisis pregnancy come from all socioeconomic backgrounds. The majority of the women are married or in a stable relationship when the crisis occurs, and they come from every age range. The average age of when a crisis pregnancy occurs is 24 years for a woman and 25 years for a man. And this shows that the often held perception that crisis pregnancies primarily happen to teenagers is unfounded. We're now going to address just some of the um, issues as to why a pregnancy is a crisis. And really there's a variety of reasons, often particular to the age of the woman and the point in her life that it occurs. The most common reason is because the pregnancy isn't planned. Women and their partners often consider themselves too young, and with the average age of childbirth increasing year on year, we can see that women in their 20s, who may not have considered having a child at that point in their life, um, it's, it's not a, an option for them. Other reasons were reported were financial, uh, relationship concerns, or health concerns also. We're now going to look at some of the decisions made following a crisis pregnancy. And again, we can see that research shows us that 73% of respondents in a 2012 study chose to parent following their most recent crisis pregnancy. Abortion was the second most reported decision, with 24% of women reporting they had an abortion following their most recent crisis pregnancy. And adoption, whilst once a common decision following a crisis pregnancy, has really reduced significantly from the 1970s, where there was nearly 1,500 adoptions, to seven domestic infant adoptions in 2015. We're now going to just look at the option of abortion in a little bit more detail and see some of the data that we, we have on it. 
And we can see that the UK is the most common destination for women to travel for an abortion, so we'll look at that data in some detail. The Department of Health in the UK gathers data from abortion service providers on women who provide Irish addresses in UK abortion clinics. In 2015, 3,451 women gave Irish addresses at UK abortion clinics. This is a decline since 2001 when 6,673 women gave Irish addresses and the decline has been gradual over those years. We can see with this graph that the rate of abortion has decreased from 7.5 women per thousand in 2001 to 3.6 women per thousand in 2015. The 2015 data has been broken down by the Department of Health in the UK to provide some characteristics of the women that travelled in that year. We can see that women were from all 26 counties. The majority were in their 20s or early 30s. The majority had an abortion before nine weeks gestation. Majority were married or in a relationship. The majority were white Irish. Just under half reported having a previous child and approximately one-fifth had a previous abortion. We also know from research that women of higher earning power are more likely to travel for an abortion than those of lower earning power. If we now just look at the issue of the abortion pill and the use in Ireland. Abortion pills are designed to induce an abortion in pregnancies that are less than nine weeks gestation, and they're used in medically supervised clinics in countries where abortion is illegal is legal, sorry. The supply of abortion pills or any other prescription medication over the internet is illegal. And whilst it is illegal to both supply and take the abortion pill in Ireland, some women are still accessing and taking abortion pills bought on the internet. There has been limited information um, and research available on the use of abortion pills by women in Ireland due to the illegality of the practice. However, a recent research study published in October 2016 in the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynaecology examines the experiences of Irish women seeking and taking abortion pills accessed from the online provider Women on Web. The study shows that over a six year period between January 2010 and December 2015, a total of 5,650 women from the island of Ireland consulted with Women on Web. In 2010, there were 548 online consultations, and this increased by more than two and a half times in 2015 to 1,438 consultations. The study further breaks down the period during 2010 to 2012 to show that 1,642 women were sent the abortion pills within the island of Ireland. Whilst it's difficult to make an assessment on the issue of abortion pills in Ireland from one study, it does highlight the recent increase in women seeking information or seeking access to abortion pills online. So the next part of the presentation, we're going to look at some of the crisis pregnancy services that are funded by the HSC and available to women and their partners who experience a crisis pregnancy in Ireland. Some of the services, um, are provided through the HSC, as I said, funded services. Counselling on all three options are provided under the legal framework of the Abortion Information Act 1995. And the Act sets out how information on abortion about legal abortion services outside of Ireland may be given to women and their partners in Ireland. The HSC funds 16 services in over 40 locations nationwide, and they're set out there on the map. Crisis pregnancy counselling is provided free of charge through state funding of the crisis pregnancy counselling service and research finds that some women who experience a crisis pregnancy may resolve the crisis themselves but others may rely on the support of their family or friends or a health professional including a GP or a crisis pregnancy counsellor. All funded crisis pregnancy counselling services provide non-directive, non-judgmental, client-centred counselling to allow the woman's space to reflect and make her own decision on the options available to her. The woman is given space to uh, explore all of her options through the counselling session. 
and the Abortion Information Act clearly sets out where a woman seeks information on legal abortion services, she must be counselled, advised and fully informed on all the options that are available to her, including parenting and, and adoption, before information on the names and addresses of abortion clinics can be given. We see also that the Abortion Information Act sets out um, that, that counselling services in Ireland must not be seen to promote, advocate or benefit financially from an abortion service provider. The counsellor is not permitted to make a referral or an appointment for the woman. She must do this herself. The law also does not oblige any individual to provide information on abortion services and allows for conscientious objection. Within the 16 funded crisis pregnancy services, two services do not provide information on abortion clinics due to the ethos of their service. All funded services must display their ethos on their website and other advertising material and must outline to a potential client what information they can and cannot provide. An appropriate referral to another service must be made where the agency does not provide requested abortion information due to their ethos. If we look at the Abortion Information Act, it's recognised that it is over 20 years old and in those 20 years there have been many developments in technology and access to the internet. Many men and women are now bypassing crisis pregnancy counselling services and accessing information directly from the internet. And the reduction in crisis pregnancy counselling and numbers attending crisis pregnancy counselling may reflect this situation. We can see that the numbers accessing crisis pregnancy counselling services have reduced since 2004, where there was a high of 9,158 down to 2,787 in 2015. While the numbers attending services are decreasing, service providers report that those attending services are experiencing more complex and more multiple issues. We in the HSE have commissioned a review of all funded crisis pregnancy counselling services in order to put in place a sustainable plan that reflects the change in demand for crisis pregnancy counselling. We must note as well that whilst the 16 crisis pregnancy services funded by the HSE provide non-directive, non-judgmental counselling under the requirements set out by the law, not all services claiming to provide support to women are genuine. These counselling services are set up to influence the choice a woman makes and to pressure a woman into doing something she doesn't want to. They often target women seeking information on abortion, use inappropriate images and make unfounded claims during counselling sessions. We must remind women who have been affected to report their concerns to the Gardaí and to only attend a service which is funded by the HSC through the Positive Options website to ensure she receives genuine support. Finally, I just want to outline some of the services and supports available to women following a crisis pregnancy and in particular following an abortion. Post-abortion counselling is provided by the same service providers that provide crisis pregnancy counselling. And post-abortion counselling provides a space for a woman to explore her feelings towards the decision made. The uptake is low in Ireland and this is reflected in other countries where abortion is legal. All clients attending um, abortion services in the UK are provided with information on the availability of post-abortion medical checkups. These are available free to women through family planning clinics and other GPs and they provide an opportunity to discuss any medical concerns or long-term contraception needs with a medical doctor and all information is available on abortionaftercare.ie. We also see that the, the uptake of these services remains relatively low, um, but the service is, is available there free of charge. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and I welcome any questions you have after your discussion. Mm -hmm.